In our podcast, we talk about disruptions. Uh, Mike is a strategy professor. I do a lot with technology and project management, and we talk about disruption. Uh, and at the end of our episodes, we talk about good disruption, bad disruption, and no disruption at all. Some certain forces around us that we think are disruptive, but then we think maybe they're not going to end up to be as disruptive. Um, and today, today we have the joy because we're going to be focused primarily on the good, uh, because we have three incredibly good disruptors uh, in front of us. Uh, and so we're going to really benefit from uh, mostly very positive disruption. Um, but Mike, do you want to start us off and say a little bit about the topic of today's session? Yeah. So typically we talk about technology and these technologies whether they're going to be disruptive. But at the end of the day, any disruptive technology probably has a disruptor behind that there. And so we're going to focus on good disruptors and also the topic of sustainability, which is one obviously near and dear to my heart. Uh, and an area where we need a lot of disruption. So just to put some uh, you know, scale on this here, if you think about the scope of the sustainability challenges we have uh, in all dimensions, in the environment and social, social justice and the like, uh, it can be quite overwhelming. And uh, just take one very large issue, climate change, and what needs to happen for us to make significant progress on climate change, we're talking about fundamental disruptions in technologies and industries and business models and just behavior across a vast number of sectors here. Um, so we're, we're moving quickly into a world, I think, where we need even more uh, disruptors than we've had in the past. So Yael, maybe to kick us off as well, um, what makes a good disruptor? Oh, what makes a good disruptor? Uh, we have some examples around us. If you guys each close your eyes and you think of maybe not so good disruptors uh, and leaders, uh, I'm not going to ask the audience about what you think about Elon Musk, but uh, we can imagine <laughs> that some disruptors can be kind of controversial just because of the position that they are in, uh, trying to carve a new path forward. Good disruptors are visionaries that can deal with wicked, messy problems and make sense of a lot of uncertainty and maybe identify ways in which they can really get different stakeholders to care about their topics and to believe that there is a way forward when there's no real clear path from A to B. And so good disruptors, especially in this space, uh, uh, understand the challenges and don't expect people to follow blindly, but understand that there's gonna be research and efforts and two steps backwards before they can move forward and be patient and recognize that people need to follow in their own way. Um, I just want to follow on you. You mentioned Elon Musk. We had talked about doing a podcast specifically on him. Interesting debates we could have about good or bad disruptor. Just to be very clear here, all good disruptors today, right? So there's no <laughs> judgment here. We got three amazing good disruptors with us, which we're very excited about. So, and uh, yeah. I'm going to actually use that as yeah. my lead in and yeah. I'll do a brief introduction. Um, I'm going to read from a page, but that's going to be the last time that I do that today, if that's okay. Um, I'm going to say a sentence or two. Uh, each one of our speakers here on the panel, our panelists have so much more than my couple of sentences uh, give them credit for. So we encourage you to read their bios that we provided, but also reach out to them uh, after the session and talk more. So uh, Krisa Pagitsas is a strategic advisor to senior executives and boards on the intersection of environmental, social, governance, and global business. Uh, she was the VP of ESG at Fannie Mae for several years, and in that capacity, she was in charge of building the world's largest green bond program from zero to one billion portfolio. Uh, she also wrote a recent book, uh, The Chief Sustainability Officers at Work, showing how 25 CEO, CSOs and head of ESG are moving from commitments to tangible and measurable results. Thank you for being here today. Um, we're going to go to... Uh, Chance Lande Russell. Uh, Chance is a voice for the oppressed and vulnerable and ensuring public projects are equitable. She builds bridges between communities in planning and engineering uh, practitioners to create safe and healthy neighborhoods. She uh, co-founded and recently, recently sold um, Inspiring Green in 2009 was founded, an environmental consulting firm established to shape approaches and attitudes for sustainability and community development through public involvement and outreach. And she was an environmental specialist at Texas Instruments for a few years before that. Thank you for being here today, Chance. And finally, Lori Katz, uh, Gemba 2016. I'm just randomly adding some facts to it. <laughs> um, uh, ocean scientist and globally focused conservation practitioner with over 15 years of experience internationally and domestically. 
highly skilled international nonprofit manager with strong scientific business and leadership capabilities and a proven track record at strategic program design, execution, resource mobili mobili ah, I can't say it, mobilization, mobilization and program sustainability. I got it. And um, serving right now as the VP of Blue Nature and co-lead of Blue Na uh, Nature Alliance. Thank you so much, Lori, for being here today. Let's give him a round of applause. I, I just wanted to make sure, again, that people understand, like, this is a live audience for us, <laughs> not just in the studio, uh, the two of us. Uh, Chris, uh, Chris, I want to start with you. Um, you've just written the book on chief sustainability officers. What have you learned from these conversations about what makes a good disruptor? Great. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Al. Uh, when we think about disruption, I think about disruption from the inside of a company. I think many times we think about those innovators, those lone wolves or female wolves, but outside <laughs> with pressure in. But in fact, the area that I have expertise in and what all of these chief sustainability officers that I interviewed, they're internal disruptors. They're sitting in the C-suite at Fortune 500 companies, trillions in, in dollars in assets, billions in revenue. And what they're doing is they're really thinking about how they can move the needle, right? How can they move these massive businesses forward to really think more sustainably in an environmental way and also to have more social impact? So in talking to them, my takeaway is that those people, those individuals leading, were really good at prioritization. They understood their vision and their priorities to get social and environmental impact done through the business, but they actually also understood the priorities of all the other business leaders and operations and figured out ways to marry the two. So if you're gonna be disrupting internally, you cannot go in and flip the table and say, we must have a just society. It's not gonna work. You have to go in and understand the priorities that you have, and then also the priorities of the business, and find where the two marry. Great. Great. Uh, Lori, you work for a nonprofit, um, and you, you know, for the sake of part of this conversation, you help us think about that sector. Tell us a little bit about being a disruptor in a nonprofit. How how similar are the challenges? What are some of the specifics that you that you have to face? Thank you. So I have the the pleasure of working for Conservation International. Uh, which gives me a platform to have drive significant impact in the cause and mission that's most important to me. And so in my case, that happens to be the conservation of our shared global ocean. Um, and so I just wanted to pause and ground us in that for a second in case I'm surrounded by land lovers. Um, <laughs> so just take a second, humor me, and, and take a deep breath in. Let it out. <laughs> take one more. Let it out. How many of you knew that one of those breaths, the oxygen you just breathed in, came from life in the ocean? So every other breath that you take is dependent on a healthy ocean. Three out of seven people on this planet are reliant on seafood for daily protein needs. Three billion people get jobs and depend on the oceans for their livelihoods. And the oceans generate 2.6 trillion in economic output every year representing the seventh largest economy in the world. And so every single one of us, whether we know it or not, is actually dependent on a healthy ocean to thrive on this planet. Uh, and so part of the work is actually connecting people to these causes and to kind of the places. So for me, um, it isn't about protecting nature, although I do love to swim with sharks and whales and all the fun parts of my job. Really? The, um, the sharks? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Number, one, number one favorite thing to do. Um, but it's about protecting a healthy ocean for people. And if you want solutions for people, you have to actually involve people. And that's where the disruption comes in my work uh, and in kind of nonprofit where is, is Kind of starting to actually challenge misconceptions in my own industry uh, around that conservation and the protection of nature has to exclude people or that kind of solutions that are generated locally and within community can only stay within community and can be only small scale. So for the last 15 years, I've been working to try to disrupt those misconceptions. Um, I had the pleasure of working in West Papua, Indonesia, with Papuan indigenous communities to challenge that 
conservation, indigenous-led conservation has to be small, and they work to protect an area the size of Great Britain. Right now, the, the fund that I'm leading is trying to catalyze ocean conservation in 5% of the global ocean in five years. So just for perspective, that's two times the size of the United States. So we don't have to be small. We can challenge. Most people in my field said both of those things were impossible. Mm -hmm. And so for me, disruption is about making important things possible, whether people believe in it or not. One other major disruption that I'm seeing in my field um, is uh, a, a challenge that's coming uh, from the outside, an important disruption in which indigenous communities and local communities are challenging conservation organizations like my own to reflect upon and to dispel those aspects of our history that were rooted in colonialism and that kind of in, increased inequity in the work that we did. Um, and so I think part of my role in an, uh, a nonprofit is to listen, to listen to those other disruptors, bring voice to that into our organization, and to reimagine how we can do our work in a more equitable way. You know, Laurie, you're, you're talking about you know, this intersection between the social justice, the social peace, and the environmental peace. Uh, Chianse, you've been on the forefront of this for a long time. Can you talk a little bit about um, maybe the challenges and some of the work you do to kind of bring those two, those two things together? Absolutely. Thank you. I think that it starts with telling the truth and not being afraid to share what the truth is about um, projects that you work on. And I think that one of the things that I've noticed in the consulting world and particularly working on contracts with corporations or governments is that some people just want to check a box to say that they did some good public engagement, but they don't really want to really hear from the community or understand the adverse impacts that a project may have on a community or want their involvement. So what we found when we started Inspire Green back in 2009 was that we really had to fight um, and really use our voice that we had to say, hey, communities need to know about the projects that are happening to them, how they're going to impact them, and they need to have say so. And I particularly found it, um, even just working across DC, there were communities that were highly engaged. Um, if I went to Northwest DC, you get 150 people um, at a meeting. And then if they wanted to have a traditional public meeting across the east of the river, um, it, you had to try different tactics. You didn't, just calling a public meeting, it didn't work the same. And so people say, oh, well, we had a meeting and no one showed up, but you aren't really meeting people where, we, where they are. So sometimes it took, I, I know people call them the clipboard people, uh, we weren't really the clipboard people, but it took, <laughs> it took us sometimes doing things at metro stations. If we're trying to do a transportation project, we met people at the at where they where they get public transportation. Um, we met people where they were, and we want told people at grocery stores. Sometimes we showed up at grocery stores outside on a Saturday to get involvement. If we're talking about something that could changing a bus route or we're doing stormwater management projects because I don't know a lot of people who are going to, going to go to a meeting about stormwater management um, <laughs> anyway. So, but if we're talking about <laughs> one out of how many? <laughs> so, you know, we would have to do some things. Around. We had to be creative. We had to be creative, but we also had to let people know why it's important because you don't want resistance later on in your project. You want to get public buy-in um, at the onset. So I always found that telling the truth and telling people, even when we thought that projects were going to have some adverse impact, for example, a lot of climate plans um, I've had an opportunity to work on, we've actually had to look at it through a racial equity lens. It's like, so if we decide that we're going to put this congestion charge or this um, cordon charge for people to travel downtown, most people who have been pushed out of the city you know, now there are people who can afford to live downtown or near downtown, but there have been people who've been pushed out of the city and now they're being charged to be able to go to their doctors and be able to get to the important things that they need to, to do in their life. And we don't really think about that. And I won't get on the topic of these paper straws because um, I don't know many people who love them. I just think <laughs> <laughs> that's not a racial equity thing. I think that's just a. We, we did something to get rid of plastic, but we didn't study it a lot. Um, so <laughs> that's just a chance. That's just a chance say equity. Um, um, but, you know, no, I really think the thing is speaking the truth and not being afraid to tell the truth, no matter who's in the room. 
um, letting them know what the options are and what the consequences might be if they choose to go a different route. And that's what I found actually the most fascinating. I'm not afraid to speak truth to power. And let me ask a related question. And maybe actually you've answered some of this, but we were going to ask all three of you in a way. It's like, if you're going to be that leader, you're going against the grain or you're trying to carve a new path. How do you get comfortable in that role of a, of a disruptor? Like, how do you come, how do you get comfortable with the need to constantly face resistance and constantly answer questions? Or maybe you never do. I don't know. Um, yeah, I can start because I'm going to challenge the question Good. to begin with. Good. Um, so one of my most important mentors uh, banned the word comfortable from our team dynamic and from kind of a leader's vo vocabulary and basically said, no, if you're not uncomfortable, then you aren't driving meaningful change. Oh, we should put that on the Darden yeah. post. So, right? mm. so confident. You can be confident in decisions, knowing the risks and, and kind of exploring uh, uh, you know, new innovations. But if you're comfortable, you're being complacent. Um, so that's kind of what I've been holding. And one metaphor for it that I that's you know, related to my work that I hold a lot or, or learning that I hold is from Polynesian voyagers um, who use the, the methodologies of wayfinding. So they are able to navigate across the entire ocean way beyond the horizon of what they can see. And they have no idea what is coming and what is in front of them, but they hold their destination in their mind. And being able to hold that allows them to navigate whatever comes and whatever discomfort is there along the way. I like that. Um, being confident, not necessarily comfortable, um, because I think that's what I've always been when I come to the work. I know that it's about more than me. And it's not necessarily about me. It's about communities that I represent. And when I chose the field of environmental science and later environmental engineering, I got into it because of environmental justice. And it was before, it, it was back in late 1900s. Um, so it was, <laughs> it was before sustainability was even a buzzword. So, um, so when I chose this field, it, it came about because I was learning about communities like Cancer Alley in Louisiana, people who were dying of cancer because of you know, industrial pollution. So I didn't see myself as someone who was representing necessarily me, but I felt like I represented whole communities. And because of that, it didn't matter. It really didn't matter what I felt. I felt like I had a greater charge. So I was always confident in what it was. And I know that sometimes there res there's resistance, but I don't think that it, sometimes it comes because of a lack of perspective. Um, but and sometimes it comes, frankly, because profits do come over people. Um, and so we have to make people let them sit in that, too, and, and, and figure out if they're really comfortable um, with that or confident uh, in, in what they want to do. So I like that. I think I've just always been confident because I knew that I had like a greater responsibility. So it, it's a great question. And I I'm actually going to challenge the confidence statement. <laughs> I, I think you do need to be confident in your vision. So I actually think that you must, when you are a disruptor, have a vision. If you don't, you will get lost. I will say, though, that somebody who's been at this intersection of energy, sustainability, finance, and real estate for over 20 years, I would say also as a woman, it's hard to be confident in something that's new when there is an established system. And I say this as a white woman, recognizing obviously there are many more challenges for people of color and of other genders. So. I put this out there as that confidence is good. I think having a vision is better in the sense that it sustains you in your confidence to make the connections that you need to bring people to share the vision with you. So my, you know, in 2010, I, I joined Fannie Mae. I was hired to start a green thing, right? That was it. That was like, go do something green. I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> I can do something more in green, you know, I have my Darden MBA <laughs> as well as I have years of experience before this in real estate and, and energy, I, we can do something more. But the thing that I created was the green financing business, the green bond business, that between 2010 I took from zero, there was nothing, to 50 billion, right? That, that happened because I was confident in the vision, but I didn't know where I was going. I had to get the underwriters to be on board, the asset managers to be on board, the lenders on board. And so I say that with this duality of you need to walk in the room with a vision that's going to propel you through finding the people to make it real. Um, and I would say that in certain fields, it's very intimidating to be confident 
with an innovation because green financing, green bonds was on nobody's mind at Fannie Mae in 2010. That was, no, that was not it. So, so, so there is a balance there. Have confidence, but bring people in um, to make it happen. So thank you for that. I, I want to take a little bit of a pivot here and getting back to like our Elon Musk point here. There is, dare I say, a, do, do a narrative. People, do people know that Mike has, is a big Elon Musk fan? No, 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 no. We can debate. <laughs> we can debate. Because where I'm going is, you know, um, the, let's call it the dark side of disruptors here. This idea of, uh, I'll call it the tech bro mentality that you got to go and break eggs, move fast. And it's all about, you know, taking your vision and confidence and maybe, I dare I say, enforcing it on others there. Help me, help me with the, the nuance here of, of how hard do you push, how do you push, and maybe how do you avoid the toxic forms of disruptor? Can I take this one? Because I just gave you a big speech about bringing people in. <laughs> I also broke eggs, right? I think in order to be a disruptor, whether externally or internally in a company, fundamentally you're asking for people to change and that is perceived as breaking eggs. And again, there's an added layer as a woman. What does it mean to be pushing things, changing the status quo, particularly in certain industries? So I actually own a Tesla, so I am a fan, <laughs> I am a fan of the technology. Yeah. Um, I am not a fan of um, culture, though, that um, stomps on everything in its way. And I think that's the balance we always have is ultimately Disruption that's good is one that lasts and is embedded. And if you alienate people to the point that they're rejecting you fully, then you failed at getting that disruption to be fundamentally altering to a company's DNA, a government, a program, and our society. So there's a balance there. I don't even remember the question. That was so weird. <laughs> <laughs> the, the dark side of the dark disruptors. side of disruptors. Yeah. Well, I think that. Teresa, what you were just saying is, is, is right. Like you don't just want to stump over everything and kind of pull people along because if no one has bought into the vision, it won't last. I, that's what I think. I think that people will slow things down. Um, they will resent you. Um, they won't work as hard for you. Um, and that's what I think about. I mean, there are so many bad sides of disruption um, that we don't want to get that into today. As <laughs> I think about, I mean, like you talked about earlier, there can be leaders um, there are definitely bad disruptors and they always have a few people who agree with them. Um, and, and those people help them kind of carry out an agenda. But as a whole, I think that it gets slowed down. Like you, there's a lot of resistance to it. I think that at one point, if we're using Elon Musk as, as an example, um, the personality type, I should say, as an example, like there are people who love the technology and the things that he's doing, but I didn't have an opinion either way, maybe a few years ago about Elon Musk. I knew about Tesla's and thought that he was great, but it's like the more that he talks and the more that he does things, <laughs> that's like, oh my God, who is this man? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so you start forming a different opinion about, and as you start hearing about, you know, different things that may be happening um, within the company, you start forming a different opinion and, and it actually changes things because now there are more options on the market in terms of electric vehicles. And so people are like, you know, maybe I won't get a Tesla because now I've associated the brand with this person um, that I don't care as much for. So I'm starting to make different um, purchase decisions, which could, of course, impact the bottom line. So I think that ultimately bad disruptors, when you do have people who still aren't afraid to speak the truth um, and people who are afraid to go against it, you could they can be brought down. They can be brought down. And I think that there there's the cracking eggs. There is the we need to, we need to force change a company culture because there are some things that are fundamentally bad that are happening at some companies and we just we're just not the same company that we were in the 1930s so we need to change um culture those things are going to happen but when you're just running over people and you're not getting perspective you're not getting buy-in um it creates a culture of resistance and sometimes that's good but it, most times it's bad um, we're focused. I'm going to pivot us. Okay, Lori, but, 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 but Lori, so we don't have to talk about Elon Musk. <laughs> no, not anymore. Not for at least another couple minutes, but, um, and the audience might, might bring us other examples, but, uh, Lori, I'm going to pivot to you, uh, with the hot mic and say, this is about disruption in sustainability. And we've 
you know, picked your brain at the definition of sustainability. Uh, do you want to have a, why is it so hard? Like, why do people struggle with that word in general uh, to define it? I knew that one was coming. They gave me a little bit of warning. <laughs> warm, warm call. That's called a warm call yeah. in Darden. Um, so, I mean, I think if we asked everybody in the audience, what is sustainability? There would probably be, I don't know how many we have here, at least 100 people in the room. There'd be 100 different answers or interpretations of a very, very complex uh, concept. Um, for me, the, the definition that resonates the most is, is the idea that you're trying to fulfill the needs of today without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. Um, and within that, there you need to be able to ensure a balance between multiple things. So one of them is environmental care. One is uh, economic growth and, pro and profit and, and jobs. And the third is, is social well-being. And so bringing those three together is where you actually get at the nexus of sustainability. And I think you've heard different aspects of that from all of our different answers. You know, my career is mostly focused on the environmental piece, um, but we're having an awakening that you can't protect the environment for people without the social justice aspect of it and bringing people in. And people in societies need jobs and they need livelihoods and they need to have an economic future. And so that has, to, you know, economic solutions have to be embedded in that or there isn't a future that's going to bring people along. Um, so that's what kind of I hold um, with it. But I'm, I'm curious if my uh, other, other uh, panelists have different perspectives. Can I add one thing sure. specifically for you is uh, ESG. That was your actual title last time. CSO, ESG, same thing, different. Or sure. potato, potato. <laughs> Some people might debate it. Um, I, will, I will say that I actually do think of them as synonymous today. I, I think traditionally we had sustainability, which was nar more narrowly on environment. And then we had people who were in the social impact space who worked with people and communities. And those sort of didn't came together, but not um, in the way that I'm seeing it today. So ESG, environmental social governance, means generally that companies, but frankly, any organization is thinking about the environmental impact of their work, the social impact of their work, and then that it's within a well-governed structure from a board to all of the risk management techniques and, and approaches that you use and, and down. So my book is called Chief Sustainability Officers at Work but actually the people that were responsible for environmental issues and social issues were heads of ESG. They were also CMOs as well as CSOs. They were CPOs, chief procurement officers, and they were flavors in between. So my, my short answer, Mike, to wrap all of that up is that in some ways it doesn't matter. What it actually matters is that you as a company, you as an organization know your priorities. So. If you are Coca-Cola, so I interviewed B. Perez, um, who has multiple titles as well as CSO, water is critical for Coca-Cola. So they are focusing on water. No water, no Coke, right? For Owens Corning, right, glass and building materials, they need raw materials like sand and they need to mine it, they need to extract it in a sustainable way, or they need to make sure that it can be recycled. So sustainability and ESG today, I think, are blurring. But what's more critical is that whoever you are working in this space, you know what your key issues are. Okay. Yeah, I think that we're finding that you can't focus on one without the other, because when you do, you end up, like if you're just focusing on like water, then you're finding that now let's think about Flint, uh, Michigan. And like, if you, you don't talk about sustainability in terms of our infrastructure and infrastructure as it relates to people's homes, as we look at what's happening in um, Jackson, Mississippi with, you know, the water infrastructure um, crisis that's there that you can't just focus on sustainability in one aspect and don't, and not really think about how it impacts the people um, or, or how land is impacted. And so I think that there was a time when I worked at Texas Instruments, I focused on greenhouse gas emissions reductions because, you know, they had technologies, we released PFCs, we wanted, but we didn't necessarily talk much about impact, you know, the, the people impacted that. So I think now I'm starting to see, even from a governmental perspective, um, environmental justice, the more baked into some of the policies. 
um, as it's the Inflation Reduction Act, um, as there was just the whatever. I can't think of the name of the previous bill that was just passed, but more money going to communities around um, replacing lead service lines. So we talk about sustainability. It used to just be this buzzword. You know, everybody's I'm doing sustainability. I'm doing sustainability. Um, and like you said, there'd be a hundred and something different definitions for it. But now we're starting to collapse. Like people want to hear about, well, how does this impact people? Okay. I'm curious, um, as leaders, as disruptors, and I think about the sustainability challenges as I, I laid out at the beginning. I'm, you know this, I'm an optimist, right? I generally, I'm a very positive person. But man, it, it can be overwhelming. I mean, the scope of the needs that we have, the scale of disruption that is needed, um, how do you keep? How do you keep energized? How do you keep motivated? So I think that you have to find your focus area. Like there are some people who only focus on water. There are some people who only focus on air. There's some people who focus on the people side of things. Finding your area, but also not getting caught up in what I would like to call greenwashing, where you are just doing things um, that look good from a media perspective, but they may have marginal um, impact, or they may have some impact, but we don't think about. Um, you know, just how other people are impacted. So sometimes when we talk about energy and we talk about people turning their lights off at home, it's like, why do I have to turn my lights off on, at home? But Times Square is lit up at night. <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a lot of light in Times Square. Or, or if I go around city skyline. So like, is my little, is my house, you know, just causing this whole big energy crisis or <laughs> what's happening in cities? And I'm not saying um, that one is right or wrong, but I am saying that sometimes we have to, to really think about what we're asking people to do um, and what are we willing to do to kind of offset uh, some of the things that some of the new policies that are taking shape. How many of you live in DC? So a few people. So, you know, we had the bag, um, we had the bag fee, which was five cents, had it forever. And then all of a sudden I started seeing these little signs that plastic bags are going to be eliminated completely by September the 15th. And I went to a store one day, I'm not going to name what store it was, a, a week before this. And I just happened to be out for a walk and I needed something. Um, and I stopped at this store. And you know, when you go in the store for one thing, and you got like 10 things. Um, and I got to the counter, I realized there were no plastic bags. I'm like, I thought this rule was until September the 15th. And they were like, well, oh, they, they just didn't order bags. Like they, so because this law is coming, stores are like, I'm not ordering any bags anymore. And I like watched the whole store and I'm watching people who... Um, take the bus, who are walking, who are disabled, who now you, who are very limited income. And I said, well, what's happening for people who don't have a reusable bag? Oh, they can buy reusable bags, but you're asking people to buy reusable bags who already are on a very fixed income. Like there's nothing here that's giving people. So I watch people leave the store. Like with, I was one of those people who <laughs> just leave, leave. Then I went back, well, let me not cut off my nose to spite my face. Let me go get the one thing I did come for. But my point is, is that, you know, there was this, there's this new policy. One, I don't think it was communicated effectively. Um, but two, I don't think that we really thought about like how our communities um, who are most vulnerable, who don't have the income, the extra income, like, are we supplying bags to people? Or are they just supposed to show up? Because five cent, when you add that up on groceries, that can be a lot of money. When I've done my budget, that can be an extra cost and a burden. So are those plastic bags, what, what's the alternative? I guess that's the question. Like when we're taking away things, like how are we helping people get through this? Now, funny enough, I went back to that same store um, about two days ago and it was full of plastic bags. And I was like, well, September 15th passed by <laughs> already. And I think that there was enough public outcry about this new policy that they have held it back for another year. I um, mean, that's just an example of one, making sure that we communicate poss uh, policies effectively, um, but two, also making sure that communities um, who need some type of supplement, that they're supplementing. Because I really watch people struggling to get on bus, like holding things in their hands and stuff like that. And so I know that sometimes our policies can have unintended consequences. I'm always about that. Uh, so you're asking about self-sustainability. Too. Yeah, yeah, that's a great way to put it. <laughs> so I think sustaining yourself by thinking about the community is important, right? So I think you. Oh, I'm sorry, I asked the wrong question. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> I took, no, no. So I actually took something from it, which is that thinking about the community and the impacts of it, right, is a way actually to have purpose, right? You're helping people. You're helping think about how does one action help that one person who is disabled, who is trying to get on the bus, and did need thing ten things to take with them on the bus, right? Um, so I, I think finding individual days of joy and, and optimism is important, right? I'm, I'm learning about composting, 
right? Here I am in my mid forties and in the sustainability field, and I am just learning about composting. And let me tell you, it's fascinating and it's hard. And it stinks. But, and no, not stinky actually. But <laughs> so, so I think one is finding ways for me to continue to learn and to, contrib to contribute in my own small way, even if it is turning on, off my own light. I think the other thing that I've had to do now that I'm you know, not with Fannie Mae, I'm on my own, I'm advising companies, I'm just one person now. I'm not part of a $3 trillion company, 7,000 people, right? I am just me. And so what I've actually had to do is actually think about what's my own impact metric, right? So when I take on a new client, I actually take a moment to think about, will I be able to help them move the needle, right? Am I going to be moving a policy forward? Am I going to be teaching the board about how to be uh, thoughtful around ESG strategy? So I would say there's personal optimism and personal actions, but I also think when I operate now in a business setting, I'm trying to think of what's going to be Krisa Pagitsa's uh, impact report at the end of 2022, if I had to write that for just me. Um, and that's how I think about it. Metrics-driven strategy, but how do I help people amplify their work? That's great. That's so insightful and connects to stuff that I try to teach sometimes in project management around long projects get bad rep because by the time the project is done, the client has moved on and nobody's interested with what the project was all about. And so um, this mantra of thinking about the client always, what is your press release going to look like? What are you going to announce to the world? What are your customers going to be passionate about, which is consistent with your, with your annual impact kind of uh, report? Um, maybe the final question before we open the floor to the audience. Um, I'm going to sound like a decision analysis professor, so uh, forgive me because oh, I am. I know yeah. I am a decision analysis prof professor, but we talk a lot in DA and decision analysis um, about uh, multi objectives, multi criteria. How do you weigh criteria objectives in front of you in order to make a decision? No decision is purely about profitability or purely about the environmental. Um, but they're all multifaceted. What tricks have you developed over the years to, or frameworks or kind of tools that you have at your disposal that you use to uh, lead the disruptions that you each are leading or, or in, engaged in while thinking about all those multiple criteria that the problems um, touch? And whoever is holding the mic can go and then you can pass it along. <laughs> um. I wanted to quickly touch upon the last question, if you don't mind, and then I'll, I'll think about that one. Um, so just quickly, for people who are virtual or listening to this, um, they don't have the benefit of the people in the room who can see that I'm visibly pregnant at the moment. Um, so for me, one of the things that I hold on to in, in a field that has a lot of things that take away hope um, is the focus on my children and kind of the next generation and who I'm doing this for. Um, and so I think also in a, in a room of women who are wanting to be leaders in the various different fields that everybody is here uh, to grow and, and expand in, just wanted to acknowledge that that's it's actually a, a gift that helps us in our leadership. Um, and being a parent has been one of the most um, hope-filled and inspiring things that that I do and hold on to. So just, just side note. Um, I feel like I'm holding multiple objectives all of the time. And, and we defined, you know, the, the idea of sustainability holds really complicated trade-offs in it all of the time, right? So I, I spoke earlier about the fact that in, in conservation, the, the previous model was let's block areas off because humans hurt nature. So let's keep areas, you know, humans away from nature. And that is the solution. Um, but then there's absolutely no way for people to benefit from that um, if they're kind of forcibly removed or kept out of the, the situation. So it's a whole new, um, it's a whole new solution set to actually think, how do we come up with a use of space that protects nature, that engages people, that increases human health, that, uh, deepens our connection and spiritual connection to land and water. Um, and so I think the, the, the act of holding both of those objectives in equal measure 
not prioritizing one first and foremost and saying, you know, nature is it and I'm going to do that at whatever cost and whatever human sacrifice. But you got to you have to actually mean it. You got to have to hold the different objectives and balance them. And that does create trade offs in one or the other to be able to come up with an optimized solution that advances you know, both of those objectives uh, together. So that's a, it's Perfect. a lot of decision analysis, but really making sure you hold hold all of the objectives together. I, I would say a, it's, it's not a tip or trick. It's a you must do this. So this is a this is a step one, I think, for any change maker, particularly um, when you're operating in the environmental social governance space um, is build the surround sound. So in ESG, there's a, a fundamental first step where you get a materiality assessment, which is what, what are those priorities that will affect your organization and what do all of your stakeholders think about it? It is critical to get a hugely diverse set of voices. Chanse, you've talked about it. Laura, you've talked about it. The reason why it's important to get the NGO's perspective, the local government's perspective, the trade association perspective, the investor's perspective, the employee perspective, and many, many more, is that when you, as an individual who's the change maker, is walking into the room, it's not because Chris has said so. It's because the customer, the employee, your investors, all the people that you are working with and trying to convince, hear it from somebody else. As much as I'd like to think, you know, our voices aren't discounted, whether as change makers or as women, they often are. So how do you get that around that you surround yourself with the with the really strong opinions of other stakeholders in your company organization success. So I, I would say that the way to move forward is to not go it alone and to do it with lots of voices. So more than a tip, it's a it's a must do for anybody in this space. Final thoughts? Any final, final thoughts? Uh, amazing disruptors can really change the world uh, quite literally uh, for us and for our future generations. And we are just lucky to have them in our uh, in our communities, in our, in our surroundings. And we should encourage potential disruptors around us to to follow their hearts and their vision, because without them, uh, we would definitely all be lost. So please join us in thanking Thank our three panelists.